Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That's Brendo. How are you? I am well. On this rainy Thursday. Yeah, it's pissing the day now. Actually, should we say the day that we actually record this? Yeah, I'm okay. On this rainy. It doesn't make any difference. Yeah, true. The um, yeah, we generally record on a Thursday. Generally goes out by the Monday if we can get pull our finger out. Usually, yeah. Um, first things first. We found Turla. Well remembered. Yeah. Yes, we did. Rem- we found Turla. Um, and so sorry to anybody that's listening who thought that this week there might be a chance at winning the prize. Yeah, huge the, prize. Yeah, the huge prize of 111,000 sats. Um, ter- ter- I know. Uh, ter- sorry, we do. I'm looking at a face on the screen here, guys. Teaser. Um, yeah, we found Terla. Ter- Terla has been paid. Um, so thank you very much. And, for- and so now we're well. back to zero. Back to nothing. <laughs> we're starting all over again. Woohoo! <laughs> um, but we're starting with a guest. Yes. Who's the guest? We have, we didn't actually ask what we can call him but i'm oh, gonna yeah. i'm gonna assume we can say his full name you want to nod? Then, yeah you introduce yourself hey boys it's uh pete dunworth here it's great to be with you i've listened to a few of your episodes a lot of fun and um hats we've had a couple of conversations that uh went on for a bit i'm just thrilled to be here and being able to talk about bitcoin with you so well, good to go let's first of all let's address the elephant in the room all right so you have been fraternizing with the enemy Oh, <laughs> yeah. All good. Um, I'm, only, me, I'm, I'm, only, I'm only kidding, Jake. I'm only kidding. We're all here for the same thing. Uh, Do you want to explain uh, that? So, uh, yeah, uh, because I, I believe I've not listened yet, but I, I saw you were going to be on with Jake. Um, correct. So, yeah. we will try if we can to. Well, I've not, we've not, I don't know if it's out yet. I haven't listened about well, but we'll try and if we can steer in different directions, just for, for some people might listen to both. Uh, no, but no, hang on. We're going to ask questions and he's going to go. Oh, Jake asked me that. That's all right. That's all right. You give, yeah. Yeah, but we'll send people Jake's way. That's fine. And so I think I actually alerted hats to this. So I sent him the link from Jake saying, oh, I'm, I'm interviewing, you know, Pete Dunworth, blah, blah. And I think I just sent the link and said, fucking Jake. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah that was exactly what you said. Um, Jake, fucking hell, man. Yeah. Oh, Damn look you, at Jake. this. What have you done? Oh, he's got a leech on his second, leg. Second time I got a bloody leech on me. Pete, welcome Ooh. to the welcome to the chaos of my garage. I love this. Jesus. Can we first of all, um, where did that go? Give mm. people a little bit of a. Are you still wrestling with a leech? No, so just, what, it's no, let's in your garage. Let's this for now. Yeah. What Brando does is he comes around to my house. He's too afraid to smoke at his own house. Um, he comes around and he smokes in my house. He doesn't. He, he's always hiding around the back to see if somebody in my family spots him smoking. He doesn't want to be spotted by anybody. Um, and he went out to the garage. He's been pissing with rain and I, and when it pisses with rain, I've got loads of leeches. Oh, so, look at the sides of it. Look at it. Well, there you go. So hey, anyway, we'll ignore that. Sorry. This is a great start. Yeah. As always. Let's... Well, he- hearing about those leeches just brings up childhood trauma for me. When um, I went Please. away to a boarding school for six months and um, we'd, we'd hike every weekend and, you know, it used to rain every other weekend and basically you'd be infested in a leech pit basically and forever removing big, Thick, juicy leeches off your calves and feet. It's foul. They're so, they're so gross. Yeah. I, just, you're talking about leech trauma. You just reminded me of something. I went on a sort of hike thing in Asia once, and a mate of mine, who is an Aussie, yeah. we were all in a, in a waterfall, and we all came out, and everybody's covered in leeches, right? But he was covered in these leeches, and he just whipped his trousers down, like whipped his, his shorts down, and he's literally going... Where are they? Where are these bend over? And I was like, oh my God, there's an image I do not want. But I've still got it. Did you help him remove them? (laughs) What was that? Did you help him remove them? I I know. I I, I told them where they were. I didn't touch Uh, them personally. (laughs) Anyway. Was was there an iconic scene out of Stand By Me, that movie in the 80s, where he reaches down into his undies and there's basically a leech in his his nuts? yeah. Yeah, that was. That was maybe that was maybe maybe I'm confusing the two things at yeah. long time. That's a, long time <laughs> that a great movie. That's a really good movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. All right. So where are we gonna go? Well, hang on. We need to get the in the intro. Yeah. Who he is? What what exactly. you do, That's mate? Exactly. All that. Okay. So 
My name's Peter Dunworth. I run a multifamily office in Double Bay, looking after a number of high net worth clients and have some ancillary clients who we look after directly for Bitcoin. Um, and we advise on basically their Bitcoin custody and estate planning issues that uh, get brought up around effectively passing their Bitcoin on to their beneficiary. So um, we've been doing this um, in the Bitcoin space since late 2016. So um, we're fairly comfortable um, in that space. And um, unfortunately or fortunately, Bitcoin really captures so much of my attention. Um, it's just just becomes all consuming because you sit there and realize what this thing is. And, you know, it um, <clears throat> really takes um, a huge amount of discipline and effort to look at the traditional finance space, which, you know, we, we have to offer. Well, not we don't have to, but we do offer advice on traditional assets as well. But um, it's very clear to me where the future is and what, what the, the potentiality is for this asset. And what I see is the limited downside if you have a very long time preference. Um, and in light of all that's happening in the markets at the moment, you know, you've got really fast, well, really fast rising interest rates, which is causing havoc, havoc across the markets and all asset classes. And then you've got this really profound stable asset um, that, or stable network, I should say, and make the distinction between the network itself and the abstraction of the US dollar price or Aussie dollar price that we put on top of it. But, um, you know, it's incredibly stable versus the, the instability and volatility that we see in traditional markets. But um, it just takes a while to understand that. But um, I, I try and spend as much time as I can with clients talking about this because it, it's going to be a, a really important part of their future and, and our future, I believe. So your clients are tend to be sort of high net worth. You don't have, am I right in saying you'll have a small number of clients that are quite wealthy? Is that? Well, it is exactly double right. buy. Yes, double buy. Double buy. Yeah. That's right. That yeah. is double buy. Yeah. Um, but yeah. the 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 average the sort of demographic of those people, they'll be generally older than maybe are they retirement age or not quite. Exactly. So we're probably fairly similar ages. Um, I'd be a little bit older than you boys, I'd say. But um, I think of our parents' generation. That's our typical typical clients that we look after. So sort of sixty plus years of age. Um probably not too um, good on a technical front and they want to outsource that that um, role of investing their assets. So that's basically where we step in and try and provide um, some very conservative financial advice to protect their assets and make sure that they've got those assets at the end of the day to pass on to who they want to, to leave that to. So you're, you're, you're a financial sort of advisory business, yes? Yeah, exactly right. So investment advice. Yeah, but you're, um, but based on the demographics of, well, I, we, I think with all the three of us here are all pretty strong believers in Bitcoin, but based on the demographics of your customers, I mean, we all understand that this is going to be volatile for a period of time yet, right? I don't, yeah. I don't know how long that's going to be, but you, you can't be um, given your position as well, given that you, I'm sure you have, you'll have um, regulations to adhere to too. You can't be, um, balls to the wall bitcoin you have to be conservative with these people's money so how does how do you take your own how do you bring yourself out of your own personal beliefs yeah. and then pass on good advice to somebody who over the next who might be looking at a might be looking at a 20 or 30 year time frame rather than a 40 or 50 year time frame that's a great question because i think it's really important to be you know, cognizant of your biases for, you know, your preferred investments and what you like to look at. But, you know, the range of assets that we give advice across range from, you know, property, shares, bonds, um, private equity, alternative assets. Um, and, and you know, we look at cash as well. And, you know, when you take a step back and, you know, listen to what the clients want to achieve with, you know, their investments, uh, the last 12 months has been a very, very tough conversation to have because you look at the chaos that's happening in the markets, um, you know, and you go through the asset classes of what you can invest in right now. It's really, really hard work. It's, mm -hmm. it's, there's no clear direction in the market. So, you know, being an Australian, we're all obsessed with property. We probably have all been property investors at some point in time. And 
our clients, you know, love property and are heavily invested in it. But you look at the interest rates and where they're moving to and understand that, you know, the, you know, the, the valuations of these properties are basically um, valued on their, their cap rate or the, the rental yield that they can achieve from them um, and the net rental yield. And all of a sudden, these rising interest rates are just totally smashing those those rates. Mm-hmm. So, in effect, it's bringing down the valuations of these properties, um, and that's across every asset class. That then you move to equities, you move to bonds. Bonds have been totally smashed. One of the most outrageous, um, and I'm not a fan of bonds. And you can probably imagine that you know, being a Bitcoiner, everyone's you know got a bias against bonds because they're government issued or predominantly government issued. But um, an example a client sent me was uh, in November 2021, if you purchased a uh, £100 uh, 40-year gilt, um, which is the, the UK bond market's government-issued uh, 40-year bond, um, if you purchased £100 of that in September last year, you had lost 75 of that £100 that you'd invested. Wow. Yeah, that was, that was the, with the... Uh... The sort of the handover at Rishi Sunak and what was the what was I don't even remember the lady's name. It was there for about five days. Um, Trust oh, Liz, Liz Trust was it? Oh, yes. <laughs> so that was yeah. that, that was that carnage, yeah. That was that carnage, and 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 the interesting thing that most people don't really understand about bonds, and you know, most advisors, most most you know clients look at bonds and think, oh well, this is the safe alternative because it's cash, and you know we can still get our money back, and it's like, well. Yes and no, and we haven't advised on bonds in a long, long time because the problem with bonds is is that, say for that person um, who invested that £100 and lost the 75 in order to get their £100 back, they need to hold that that issued bond for the next 39 and a half years yeah. to get that 100 bucks back at a half a percent interest rate when, you know, UK gilts on the 40 are currently sitting at 4% or 3 and a half or whatever the number is. So that capital has literally been ripped up and destroyed never to come back. And this that, is what most... Sorry. Yeah. All I was going to say is that's even... I mean, even if inflation runs at, you know, the the, 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 the wanted 2% every year for the next 30 years, you're still going to destroy the value of the cash. Yes, that's right. And and that never comes back. That's absolute capital destruction in its purest form. Mm-hmm. And and this is where the distinction between, say, equities and, and bonds are, is that most people think... And, you know, conversation, you know, you probably listen to Greg Foss talk about this, you know, bonds are the last, well, the first claim on any outstanding, you know, assets of a company. So the equity holders are behind them in a, basically a, a, a liquidation of it. However, bonds with that, say, guilt example that we put forward is that £75 is never coming back. It won't go up in value when there are other bonds on the market at a 4% rate. So that that's now benchmark at 25, capital ripped up, never to return. And the difference between bonds and equities is that, you know, your equities can drop 75%. So if you look at, say, Kathy Woods, we've worked with Kathy for many years and a whole, you know, number of other, you know, fund managers in that space. Kathy might drop 75%, but her equities have a chance of bouncing back to that original value and then exceeding that because they haven't ripped up there's no capital destruction there unless you sell out of that fund. There is a chance it bounces back. So this is sort of a misconception that, you know, people think, oh, bonds are a really safe place to play. And, you know, if we just put our money into bonds, we're going to be fine. But it, it's not what what it looks like. And this is where part of our, you know, um, process in investing money is to to educate clients about some of the risks of the assets that are out there at the moment. And when sort of putting a, you know, uh, tying this back into, you know, the original question. When you look at all of the individual risks around all of the assets out there at the moment, all of a sudden Bitcoin doesn't look as bad yeah. as what everyone else is dealing with. And, you know, just recapping that really quickly, you've got properties been on a tear for the last 40 years. We now have all-time high property prices and all-time low interest rates, whereas 40 years ago we had all-time high interest rates and all-time low asset prices. Basically, asset prices have gone up, interest rates have gone down, and now we're at the turning point of interest rates coming back up. And I know there's talk they'll come back down, but it's not really a great deal for anyone under 40 looking at property thinking, hey, I've got the next 40 years of you know lowering interest rates because when they hit zero, there's not really too much further that they can drop. Um, 
ironically, in 2018, there was an article by the IMF that talked out talked about the best way to get out of a deep recession is to have deep negative interest rates of somewhere between negative 5%. Can you imagine? I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, no, I can't is the short answer. I just can't because, like, what would it could, because at that point it goes to the, what what is the reaction of the normie? And I, and I look at the normie just now and I'm like, I can't understand their behaviors. I don't understand why they're, what, what, why they're doing what they're doing. So, yeah. so I so I then can't look at them and, and wonder what they would do in that. And I think they would lose their shit. I've got a plan for us, actually, if that does happen. And I'm thinking of the three of us chip in. We go and buy John Simon's house, which apparently is for sale for $150 million. We borrow all of it, and the bank will pay us maybe somewhere between 2 and 5% to... Uh, yeah. basically live in it and borrow money from them. So we might get paid somewhere between two and seven and a half million bucks a year to go and live in that house. Which wing would you like? What do you reckon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, There's I mean... a few bedrooms there. I think we could move in families. It'd be great. But um, oh, yeah. this is where it, it totally it totally disrupts the whole capital allocation decision-making process. And this is where Bitcoin and having a deep understanding of that really will reinforce um, hard decisions that need to be made with capital because it is so valuable. And, you know, conversations that, that we have, we think this is going to be the fastest appreciating asset, asset in history over the next 10 and 20 years. Nothing will come close to it. And then if that's where the bulk of your wealth is going to be, you've got to be very attuned to what type of decisions you want to be making with that capital and what type of return you want to get. So all of a sudden it really helps you focus on on the type of investments you want to be making with that because it is such a good asset. So digressing, how long have you been in the kind of financial advice game? Oh, started um, in about 2000, 2001. Yeah. I straight out of uni went to BT Funds Management, which is a funds management investment business here. I was there for um, just over a year and then, a friend of mine basically pulled me aside and talked to me about mortgages and went into a, a mortgage broking business of my own. And I was there for nearly maybe eight or 10 years. And my father's um, advisor, who was chairman of one of the major financial institutions in the city, uh, basically said to me, Pete, you're on the wrong side of the balance sheet. And this happened to be in 2007. Mm. And um, you know what happened the year after it was the GFC. So it was some very sage advice to, to jump ship maybe not jump ship, but at least get um, retooled in the old qualifications that I had to work on the other side of the balance sheet and start giving investment advice. So since then, basically covered both areas. And uh, about eight years ago, I set up a, a family office with um, with my cousin, who is um, a very, very um, qualified, fabulous business partner who is... Um, basically has a list of credentials as long as her arm. I feel very privileged to be uh, partnered with with Juliet. So very fortunate there. So I've got two questions. I'm going to, um, there's kind of different. Your, your first, uh, based on your client base, your first, yeah. th their first concern is in my thought process is that it's the conservation of their wealth. It's not about growing to begin with, is it? It's about protecting Correct. what they currently have. So it's yeah. really, so really, it's a defensive business, right? Absolutely, yes. Preservation um, of capital is your number one concern for these clients. Um, and that then becomes incredibly difficult because the based on what's happening now, even if you're if you're a if you're a full on Bitcoiner and you're all, you also have a house, they may they may, you're a normal person, right? If that's yeah. you know if that's normal in my in this you know in our conversation I guess it is um so the but the logical thing to do with to right now in my opinion is to you know sell the house rent for five years and either at least sit on the cash <laughs> at least either sit on the cash or chuck it at Bitcoin that's the logical thing that is the defensive thing to do I agree but that cannot be, that cannot be the opinion of your clients right. Or the advice, or the advice he gives. Are you able to? Is it? Sorry, you tell me. How do how do I square that circle? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it's very difficult, and and this is where I spend 
far, probably I think my clients would say that I spend way too much time talking about Bitcoin relative to their other assets. And they would, I, I think, would like me to talk more about their other assets. But um, on the flip side of that, and this is how I square that circle for myself, is that if I spend time educating them on Bitcoin and answer all of their concerns, they will feel more comfortable allocating more and more to that asset as opposed to something else. Yeah. They will see what the flaws in the other assets are relative to this. They'll want to allocate more capital to it, and that will effectively help them protect their wealth in a far more, um, well, in a much less riskier manner than they're currently doing it. So that that's where I spend a lot of my time. Um, you have a like an allocation of capital to different asset classes as a business, or you have yes. you you look at, or you look at each individual client and go, okay, well here, yeah, your risk profile is a little bit different. And you adjust that. Like, how does that work? How does that process? How do you think that through? Well, we're lucky in that we're not a retail licensed financial advisor, so we've handed back our retail financial uh, financial advice license, which means we can only deal with sophisticated investors. Um, in Australian parlance, that basically means uh, clients with assets of more than $2.5 million or incomes of over $250,000. Mm -hmm. And that means our, our investment advice process is much simpler than what traditional retail financial advisors have to deal with. And it also means that any asset class is open for us um, to invest in. So got you. That opens up the ability for us to invest in Bitcoin. We've got no minimums or maximums that we we can invest in um, across each asset class. And where we've sort of come to, I think, a bit of a a um, I think a, a measured agreement um, that we think is a fair fair allocation to Bitcoin is, you know we're probably sitting around somewhere between minimum five, but realistically 10% of clients allocated capital for investments. And, and the way we get there is two ways. Firstly, five to 10% for clients, if it does go to zero, and I think the chances of that are, you know, very, very slim. But if it were to go to zero, five to 10% of their net assets isn't going to change where they drink, where they sleep, where they eat, what holidays they have, where their kids go to school, you know, what they can do for their grandkids. It doesn't have a meaningful impact on their life. It it will probably have an impact on, you know, the ego of, oh, damn, that was a really silly decision, but it's not a meaningful impact on their life, which is really critical for us to, to understand first. And then the other sort of overlay that we put on that investment advice process is with, with the sort of um, dislocation in markets at the moment, and I can talk a lot about that if you want to, but... <clears throat> What we've seen in the past is, um, well, particularly the last, say, three or four years, because of the level of debt has been rising so much, what we've seen is basically all assets now are fundamentally all all, all working in unison. They're either all going up or they're all going down. And, and this is why for the first time in nearly 100 years, you've seen long-term bonds were down um were down 30% last year. Short-term bonds were down 14%. The S&P 500 was down 20%. You know, if, if I go back in the last two major crashes that we've lived through, um, the the, G, the GFC, the bonds, short-term and long-term bonds went up and the S&P crashed 40% or whatever it was. And in the um, prior crash to that, the dot-com crash, the NASDAQ dropped plenty and the S&P dropped nearly, uh, uh, maybe just under 40% as well but the bonds went up 20% long-term and short-term bonds. So this is the first crash in, in a long, long time where bonds have, have acted in unison with, with equities as well. So there's been nowhere to hide. And, you know, we think it's bad with Bitcoin dropping 70%, but it's far worse bonds dropping 30% because they've got no chance of recovery of that that capital. That's destroyed, never to come back. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, like, and an equity is going to, like, it may recover, but... Um, but also it may go out of business. Like the blockchain is just going to to keep ticking on. Yep, agreed. And this is where, you know, trying to get a, a bigger allocation to it, you know, in, in light of all assets now acting in unison, because what I think has happened is um, there's been a consumption of debt and up until literally the last three years, people added debt. So thing there was, there was, we weren't at what I call 
peak debt saturation where all of the markets had debt in them. So there was sort of that diversification that you could achieve by having a, a balanced portfolio of property shares and bonds and cash. Um, but now because we're at peak debt and we're effectively saturated the markets across property, properties at peak debt, shares are at peak debt, bonds literally are debt, but they're at peak issuance. No one wants to buy government bonds anymore. And you look at you know the Japanese government, the largest buyer of US shares, they don't want to do it anymore. China was the largest buyer. They don't want to do it anymore. They're all trying to divest themselves of the US government bond, which is the biggest bond in the world issue. Um, so we're at peak debt now. And there's nowhere for these markets to go. So all of all of a sudden, all markets, property, bronze, shares, and 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 Bitcoin fundamentally rise and fall in unison. And to you know, you've probably listened to Preston's pod. He talks about the the Fed used to have dials and a whole range of measures that they could sort of fine tune the economy to you know you know cater for a soft landing or try and engineer one. Now they're literally working with an on-off switch. It's so either they're pumping liquidity into the market and they're dropping the rates or they're raising the rates and, you know, sucking liquidity out. But where does that leave the professional financial advisor or professional investor or, you know, just any job? Like you can't, I remember a day when, I like as a young kid, I was like the, I the financial times. I did like a fantasy <laughs> stock trading, you know, like total loser. So, um, <laughs> but I loved it, right? But, but, but even even then, as a kid, I, I felt that there was a way that you could sort of read into things and understand where a company was going, and maybe you know beat the market. And all. you can't. I just don't think you. Could, how does anybody do that anymore? When it, you know, it all just depends on a decision by twelve men and women in a room somewhere every every month or every quarter. You touch on a sore spot, a really <laughs> sore spot for me here. Um, I, I don't think there is a meaningful way to do that. Because, you know, we're looking at allocating capital for clients and we haven't yeah. allocated capital for the last 12 months because it hasn't been the right time. Yeah. Um, you know, if clients are sitting in, you know, assets, whether it's, you know, um, equities or um, property, things like that, we're happy to sort of sit there and ride that through. But if they're sitting on cash, then it's like, no, we're not allocating this market because we don't have a clear direction. And when they're, you know, that old saying, don't fight the Fed, it's it's very difficult to to have a meaningful, well, I have a positive outcome when the Fed's literally sucking liquidity out of the market. The only thing in this type of environment that we'd even, even be considering right now is until we get clear direction from the Fed, which I think we're going to get in the next six months, um, you know, is, is really Bitcoin. Like that's the only investable asset right now other than cash. That's and, it. That, so that was my next question. Is is the scared money, forget Bitcoin for a second, we'll get back to Bitcoin, but yeah. is the scared money running to cash? Is that what's happening right now? It'd have to. US dollars. Yeah. Dollars. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and this is where a lot of our investments revolve around North America, the US equity market, because when things get really bad, it's a flight to safety, the US dollar. And when things, or sorry, when things get really bad, um, capital flies to the US, which typically strengthens the US dollar and allows us to, you know, maybe if the stock's down, maybe pick up some carry on the exchange rate. So my question is for you, if you don't mind about this, this is more like a, a personal thing with in terms of Bitcoin. Um, yeah. Basically, in your line of work, a particular strategy, yes, you'd have to vary along the way, but a kind of a, a, a main thread of a strategy has been has worked for your essentially your whole career. Right, yep. you maybe had to pick your way through that strategy, but you still could. St but that changed, right? Or that has changed. Bitcoin changes everything with that. So yeah. you, you personally have had to this, see. This is God. This is a really coherent question. Um, this is where I think we're losing a lot of the so-called intellectuals. Is that, that they have had a strategy and it did work, so they're not prepared to pivot into because when something new has come along. But you've obviously yeah. had to pivot, right? Um, well, you didn't have to. Well, no, sorry, but you're sorry. No, you didn't have to. Excuse me. You've chosen to, or you've worked it out, or what? Yeah. How did you manage to do that? And how how difficult was that for you to do? Um, I, I think it's basically baby steps, right? Everyone starts out with a little, and then you know, Gigi's quote, which I think you know, I listened to Stefan's podcast, and he said, you know, the more you know, the more you buy, and that's yeah. fundamentally how it starts, and you know, a side note to that is, you know, you just start out with a little bit 
something that you're prepared to lose or you can live with losing. And um, sort of my my background to it is, you know, you guys know my brother. Um, back in 2011, when it was $3, he told me to buy something when it, when it was that. And I told him, no, that'll never work. That's stupid. Government will shut it down. You literally know the list of things I'm about to say from here on in. And, <laughs> uh, not a day goes by, I sort of, you know, just kick myself that I just just could have bought a little bit, like I could have listened to him. And, you know, Michael's such a beautiful soul. He he doesn't tell you twice. So if you hear that message from him, <clears throat> you just need to sort of read between the lines that, oh, I should be doing this and do it. And, you know, he went to San Francisco, set up a business in Bitcoin um, back in 2013. And, you know, um, Mike is one of my favourite humans on earth. I love him. He's my brother. Um, I feel so blessed that he is my brother. I learned so much from him. And I, I feel so silly saying this, but, you know, everyone's journey to Bitcoin is probably pretty similar in that, you know, we we sort of wish we had got it early. We wish we would have, wish we would have, we wish we had bought more. And, you know, I had five years of talking to my brother every other day who was literally in the thick of running a, you know, a crypto exchange and crypto services, a Bitcoin focus, but it still took me five years to figure out what this thing was and get comfortable to purchase it on a personal level. And then to actually, you know, take that across to talking about that with clients was a very different proposition back in 2016. It was like, yeah. really? What, what is this? And why is it? And really, you want me to put money into this magic internet money? Like, and, and, and one, some of the conversations we had with clients back then, because it was a, a much riskier proposition back then than it is now. Um, um, I don't want to jinx it, but I kind of feel like Bitcoin's a fait accompli to, to deliver on what, you know, some of our expectations are of it. But in 2016, it wasn't quite that way. And that was before the block size war and a whole host of, you know, other things that were potential existential threats to Bitcoin. You had, you know, Ethereum launched circa 2016 with the world computer and then all the other nonsense that they've gone on with and then you've had you know bitcoin cash and bitcoin stupid version um as wiz calls it um so you know the conversations were very different say six or seven years ago when it was talking about hey let's just have a little bit of exposure here something that's not going to be meaningful to you if it goes to zero which it could but something that will give you plenty of upside if it delivers on its you know, potential. And and this is where a conversation we had with clients was, look, let's think about putting in one to 2% of your net assets into this. If that goes to zero, that is fundamentally a bad day in the markets. And I don't mean to be flippant with, you know, a client's assets, but that is the reality of what that is. And so from a pragmatic perspective, when you put it in, in a risk adjusted terms, the fact that you can, you know, risk a bad day in the market by putting, you know, one to two percent of their net assets into an asset that could literally be 80 to 90 percent of their assets in the next 10 or 20 years, that that's a fair, fair payoff or a fair trade. And and this is where clients were happy to go on that journey with me and then, you know, buy Bitcoin back then. So yeah. I mean I guess our, our, I don't imagine imagine our average listener will be your average customer. So but just let me let me put that into numbers for for the normies out there. Like if you have ten thousand dollars in the world, you're talking about risking a hundred, right? Yeah, yep. we're risking a hundred bucks. Um, and if, it's, yeah. if we're wrong, if you're wrong, if the it's ultimately you, you know, if somebody chooses to do that, it's their, it's on, you know, it's really on them. But ten um, yep. percent, you know, um, if they're you know holding their own keys and everything, doing it themselves, um, but it's a hundred bucks. As you're talking, you're asking somebody to maybe lose a hundred bucks of a ten thousand. So that's not you you can wake up the next day and not be suicidal um yeah but on the flip so that's the downside the upside is just infinite essentially so but so your one percent becomes greater than your entire portfolio and then you are just kicking yourself away so wish you bought more but that's a much better feeling than oh my god i lost my everything yeah uh, so absolutely and and this is where sort of to take this to a fairly deep or philosophical conversation probably a little bit early but this is where holding Bitcoin, doing the research, going down that rabbit hole really has a profound impact on your outlook on life. And it, it fundamentally delivers on hope and inspiration for you that, you know, you if you do the work on Bitcoin, you think this has the ability to fundamentally change the world and basically go up forever, Laura. Um, and that, that gives you hope. 
whether you've got a little or whether you've got a lot, it 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 does profoundly change you and your outlook on on how you look at things. So were you talking to your clients about Bitcoin in 2016 or are you still on your own kind of personal journey there? Clients. Clients. So I would yep. imagine then that the the I guess the the palette has changed over the years. So 2016, a, a, a huge portion or a decent portion of your clients wouldn't have even heard of it or may yep. have heard of it but don't really have any idea what it is, whereas now you've got clients that, not necessarily understand the fundamentals, but know what it is in in some respect and, you know, are more receptive to, you know, potentially allocating, yeah? Absolutely. Now everyone has heard of Bitcoin. Like we get <clears throat> a lot of our clients are referred to us, you know, from existing clients just to look after that part of their investment for them because they know they're not going to, we we kind of I guess deliver a service to clients that we feel is much like when you go bowling. You know, when you go bowling with the kids, you basically pull out those bumpers for the, yeah, for yeah. the gutter balls to stop the gutter ball. That's mm-hmm. kind of how I view my service with my clients. Is you know we don't we don't go into you know shitcoin land. We don't want to be buying the new hot thing. We don't want to be in NFTs. All we want to do is basically buy Bitcoin because it's the only thing I'm confident that's going to be around in the next ten or twenty years. And on a personal level, I think that's going to have more upside than any NFT will ever deliver you. You just need to be patient. And when you overlay what I think the value will be in the next 10 or 20 years with the level of risk you've got to take for Bitcoin to achieve that, it, it's just an asymmetric bet. It's, you know, I think there's a, you know, a huge chance it goes to, well, I won't say the number, but, you know, Hats off, discuss that with you, and it's a stupid number. Like yeah, most yeah. people, yeah, it's well it? outside and over the window on that. It was funny though, because when we had that, so we had a, we had a call a couple of weeks back, and yeah, you, you you did see your stupid number, and, and but whilst you were saying your stupid number, I could sort of see in your face, and it was the same look as I have in my face when I'm having these conversations with people. I'm like, I'm about to say a stupid number. I know I'm about to say a stupid number. <laughs> this, this guy's going to judge me. Um, and then and and you said it, and I was like, yeah. Yeah, if anything, I'm a little, that's a little bit bearish. <laughs> like you know, like, um, but it's that's the truth of it, right? That's what we think. Yeah. So if yeah. we're honest about what we actually think, then I mean that sets a. I, I'm not saying we're, we're none of us are saying there's getting this is getting there tomorrow. Yeah. Um, but I think that's the long term picture, and if that's what you're, if you, and if you're looking long term and trying to be patient yeah. and trying to advise clients, then I mean you have to at least be honest with them in that sense. Yeah, and it, sort of to sort of expand on that, I've got a, a mate of mine who literally I catch up with pretty much every Wednesday for either golf, and I've shared some, you know, stupid numbers with him. And um, if I'm catching up with a new or potential client, he'll he'll sort of give me a call and say, now, whatever you do, do not mention the number that you think it's going to be. <laughs> yes. And I'm like, but I can't help myself. Sometimes I just love saying it, going through the rationale for it, just to see the look on the face is like, Oh shit! Where's the exit? How do I get out of here? Because this person could be crazy. But um, you look at it from a, you know, just from a human um, psyche perspective. Then you look at the deterministic nature of Bitcoin and the incentive structure that gets set up. And then once you go down that rabbit hole, you end up just thinking, yeah, that makes sense. So do you do that thing where, like, you see in American movies where, like, they sh- like they schmooze the the clients on the golf course? Like, you'll take, a, you know. Mm-hmm couple of oldies out for a hit and talk to them about this and that very very rarely if if ever do i do that um, okay because i was and, about to ask and, for and, a job <laughs> yeah it'd be great wouldn't it and, and having said that you know i literally i'm I, I feel very blessed like most of my clients are i, I consider friends you know yeah. that oh, I, I thought you were going to say our golfers i thought you were going to say golfers yeah <laughs> even better um and and that's that's the beautiful thing and you know i I feel very privileged that, you know, I get to come to work and actually talk about Bitcoin and make a difference in people's lives by getting them invested in this. And then at the same time, being able to be on a journey with friends and get them, you know, excited about Bitcoin and opening, you know, or expanding their horizons on investments um, that they otherwise wouldn't see is, you know, it's a real kick for me. That's where I get a lot of the juice from, you know, my job. Um. Can I ask you about self custody then? So, like, your how how do you address self custody with your clients? 
everyone's self custody. Yep. Um, um, everyone's in a multi seek. Everyone gets set up with their own hardware wallet. Wow. Yeah. And everyone, um, so how we set this up is whatever uh, software they'd like to use, whether it's CASA, Unchained, um, or if they want to roll their own, um, what we do is we hold a default key for them. And, mm -hmm. and typically we'll use Unchained or CASA to hold a second default key for them. And then we go through the process of setting up a hardware wallet for them and then they will hold a key too. And that, although it's not the most pure way to self-custody your Bitcoin, it achieves an outcome for us where clients have full self-sovereignty of their Bitcoin. Yeah. And at the same time, and, and this is touch wood, we've done this a couple of times now, so I can tell you that it works. Um, it would have been a bummer if it didn't, but we've had a couple of clients come to us and literally completely lose the seed words, the hardware device, everything that we set up for them. And they've come back to us and said, oh, um, hey, we've lost that. Have we lost our Bitcoin? And if they're in a traditional hardware wallet with a, a single seek setup, they would have lost their Bitcoin. And I'm talking yeah. like millions of dollars in Bitcoin. And it's such a treat for me to say, no, now you know why we go through all of this rigmarole mm. to deliver this service to you because I, I haven't found an alternative way to deliver self-custody to clients at the same time that gives them um, a redundancy backed into their systems and process that allow them to move Bitcoin whenever they want without me. But if they completely muck up everything we do for them, they've got a default there that allows them to move Bitcoins to another wallet. And we've been able to do that for a number of clients now. And it comes particularly handy um, when you start considering that we're not going to live forever. And if you're like me and that you're, Bitcoin exit strategy is death, then unless you want to make a contribution to the network, it's going to be really important that you have the ability to transfer that Bitcoin to your beneficiaries of your estate. I, I... And this is where... Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is where we've got a process that is literally inserted right in that juncture, that critical point that you want to get them to someone and you don't want anyone to know about it, but you want to make sure it gets there safely our clients basically get given a Bitcoin estate plan protocol that gives them basically um, <clears throat> a whole list of things that they need to consider, including our details and how to move those Bitcoins from wherever they are to a wallet that's fully controlled by the beneficiaries or the estate. That's awesome. I, um, I've i always had a problem with that, the notion of, you know, contributing to the network or burning, taking your Bitcoin with you. Because yeah. to me, it flies in the face of the whole idea of, you know, like everyone has family, friends, or just about, I'd hope people have friends, you know what I mean? Or they, everyone has family that they care about, surely. Yeah. And any Bitcoiner that I've talked to wants to spread the gospel, wants to spread the word, wants to save people, wants to get them on the lifeboat. So why would you want to go down with, your Bitcoin, when you you know you could save your cousin, your your loved ones, your your kids, your I, I can't so I can't get my head around it. My my only thought on that is like if you are somebody who well, there's probably a couple of things. If if there are people that are very wealthy who have the opinion that too much money can ruin a person, um, yeah. you know there has to be some value. You have to understand the value of money, earn your value. No, you can make somebody <clears throat> say you can make somebody comfortable without giving them all of your wealth, right? Yeah. Um, and but um, where else was I going to go with that? Um. Oh yeah. So but and there is no. Just so give you a tiny little example. We we were giving away those sats and that from the pod. Yeah. Um. Our wealth. Our wealth. We were giving, but but we decided to because like like who the hell are we to dis, who are who are we to know how best to allocate that? We just went ah spin it right because so it's it's almost the same. It's like it's like by letting your Bitcoin burn. You are just supporting the base for you know a family in El Salvador. That is a that is an act of charity. So somebody might somebody might die and give all their money to a dog so well, somebody else might die and give all their money to the Bitcoin network. Um it's going to happen. I've got whether people I've uh, got go on, I've got one example I'll share with you, Brendo, about why would someone do that? Mm. Um and I'm not sure um 
discussing my brother's article that he wrote in Bitcoin magazine, Bitcoin is time traveling energy. Mind blowing he, presentation, by the way. That, yeah, fu- that fucked me for the rest of the day. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you some other stuff to really bake your noodle too. So uh, if you want it, but um, he, he wrote that article in that article, he described a whole host of things, but fundamentally time locking Bitcoin to the year 2144. And what he did was he provided the private key in that article that holds one Bitcoin past the year 2140. And what that means is that if you're around in the year 2144, well, you're going to have access to basically take that Bitcoin from that wallet because there's a private key. You've got the private key. And and to put this into today's terms, what that dollar value would be, that's the equivalent of $25 trillion in today's value. And Michael's just given the key to the entire world or anyone who reads the article. And I haven't met anyone in Bitcoin who's a deeper thinker than him. In order to make sure that that Bitcoin would get taken in the year 2144, whatever it is, he put a Bitcoin in that wallet with that private key today. And he wanted to make sure that someone stole it. So he knows that if someone's stolen it now, they're definitely going to steal it in 120 plus years because it's going to be so much more valuable. Yeah. And so that took basically a web bot 15 minutes to swipe that private key and steal that Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. However, he put an Ethereum an Ethereum token into an Ethereum wallet with the same private key. And he checked back over a year later and no one had stolen the Ethereum. That's mm-hmm. how worthless it is. Wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. It's, uh... So that's one reason, but it's about the only reason. So he calls it the most, well, effectively the, the truest form of altruism. He's basically never going to see that benefit to humanity and it's fundamentally a gift to all of humanity. And if you look at the block reward in the last year of 2140, whatever it's that sat. is, it's going to be, it's it's a sat and it's a sat every every block, and that equates to 52,460 sats okay. for the year, <laughs> which goes into 100 million sats 1,902 times, and the current block reward for the last 12 months or the block subsidy um, that was paid out in US dollars was 13 and a half billion dollars. So if you assume that the block reward is not going to be any less than that in that year 2144. You can effectively multiply 1,900 by 13.5 billion to get that $25 trillion number that I talked about. We, at the end of it, sorry, at the Bush Bash, right, end of his presentation, there were people going, People going, there's going to be wars over this, well, that's... and then and then also there's going to be like a like a statue of Michael, like you know, like Fry, Fry from Futurama. Yeah, yeah. how good! Oh, it's fucking yeah. amazing. Uh, yeah, it's I a wild thought. I, I love the idea of. I loved his presentation. I don't know if I know what. Well, I don't probably nobody knows. Is like what the behavior is going to be then, whether everybody does come together as he hopes to ju- co mine for this one one Bitcoin, nope. or whether they all fight over it, like with nuclear mess. I, I mean, I don't know, but it's, I mean, it's, uh, even just thinking of the idea in the first oh, place is genius. Brilliant. It's genius. Um, yeah, I, I, I'll share a, a moment I had of madness or, or genius, but, um, in light of that thought, thinking that it's twenty-five trillion dollar gift to the future, um, I, I tried to reach out to um, Greg Foss, Jason Lowry in particular, and and tell him the national security threat that this imposes. That if you can send <laughs> one Bitcoin to the future, one hundred and twenty years into the future, and just turn up like literally, Brendo's great 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 grandkid turns up with twenty-five trillion in his wallet, yeah, that can cause some huge financial carnage in the markets all of a sudden he'll be buying up islands and yep i'll have three aircraft carrier and one of those <laughs> yeah. you know one of those jets in you know tom cruise's top gun yeah give me five of those and, and i'll have it in pink <laughs> yeah all, all of a sudden it sort of it, it it can create financial instability if that's and this is fundamentally what i believe other than the sun coming up tomorrow i think the bitcoin network working tomorrow is you know the second thing i'm most sure of in this world 
And then if you think that that's going to continue, then it's deterministic that basically it will accrue all value on Earth. And, and this is where, you know, I think we get short-sighted um, as Bitcoin frothers thinking that, oh, well, there might be $2.1 quadrillion worth of value that Bitcoin can accrue. But that's assuming that Bitcoin won't actually grow that pie. And, and this yeah. is where I think we're we're looking at it the wrong way. The pie will grow exponentially. Yes. And and basically we'll end up with a pie that's, you know, a hundred or a thousand times bigger than what it is. And we'll just have 99% of it tied up in Bitcoin. And there'll only be one percent for shares, property, equities, and and everything else. That was my genuine what you're talking about there was my genuine blow my mind moment with Knut, um, who we yeah. spoke with just before he came on. So because he wrote a piece in um Citadel, this was no, not Citadel 21. Today. Citadel 21, thank you. Um, oh, what, three years ago or something now. Um, and it was about it's not just Bitcoin isn't what all the money in the world, it's all the money, it's all the money they'll ever be. So, all the new value that's yeah. created as well. So, it's the three of us to got together today <laughs> and the site and managed to create something of value. I don't know what we would do between the three of us, but we're buying a, a someone's house. Yeah, yeah, we had any value by doing that, we'd have to put, yeah, on, uh, you know, a crazy golf course or something. Yeah. Um, but anybody who adds any value anywhere in the world. For the forever more, that all that value has to be has to be has to go somewhere, and the and the only yeah. so the only outlet there is the price. The only the, the only escape valve is uh is uh, Christine Lagarde would put it is is the price. Yeah, yeah. So it is it's forever, a Laura. I mean, it is literally. And, Either, and well, this is if, if it isn't, we're wrong, right? Do you know what I mean? If that makes yeah. sense, if the, like it, um. Yeah, if we're wrong, fair enough. But if if we're right, like that that has to be the case. Yeah, it, it literally, okay, if yeah. we are right, it's deterministic that all value, or basically, you know, to decimal places, all value ends up being on the Bitcoin network. And this is where, if you take Knut's work, I think I, I love Knut's work, and I'm I'm um, so happy he created that meme. Everything divided by twenty one million. Oh, yeah. it, it, it's it speaks literally. It is perfect, and. You know, if you look at a halfway house of getting there, how are we going to get there? And um, Pats, I think we talked about this briefly, but just sort of for everyone or anyone listening, <clears throat> we had, um, I haven't heard this discussed too much, but if you look at, you know, money's functions of store of value, minimum exchange, unit of account, for the first time in history, we've got a super store of value in that it can do everything that gold can. However, it's got absolute scarcity and it's got seizure resistant two functions and it's teleportable. Um, shout out to VJ on that. <clears throat> so there are three functions that basically, you know, gold can't do, and that's a $10 trillion market cap. Then when you flip over to medium exchange, which I don't think it needs to win medium exchange, but let's say it does, that's a $100 trillion market. And I think it's infinitely better than what we've got because it's seizure resistant. Mm -hmm. or censorship resistance. So that's a, that's a huge innovation in itself. And then you look at the final one, and the final boss, I think, is the unit of account, and that's a $2,000 trillion market or whatever the number is. It's stupid, but it's infinitely larger than the other two combined. Well, this is an immutable ledger, and this is the first time in history we've ever had it. So if you break down those four tech innovations, you know, we don't have a way of valuing it. And, you know, in my space, I look at valuations all day. I look at risk assessment, and that's fundamentally my day-to-day. -day. But we haven't, I don't think anyone's really looked at the, the individual tech innovation with Bitcoin and realised that there are fundamentally four tech innovations with Bitcoin, you know, censorship resistant, seizure resistant, absolute scarcity, and then the immutable ledger supply and issuance. When you combine those three, uh, those three things, you fundamentally have one asset for the first time in history is the best at all three of those uh, modalities of, of the money function. And for the first time in history, we have effectively a competitive tension created between each of those modalities competing for space on one Bitcoin. Yes. So rather than thinking about the value of Bitcoins going to be, oh, well, it, it's a better store of value than gold, so it's 10 trillion plus the medium exchange, which is 100 plus the unit of account, which is 2,000, so it all adds up to 2.1 quadrillion. I think that's the wrong way of looking at it because that's a, effectively a linear accretion of value, whereas this is going to be an exponential accretion of value, whereas because you've got store of value competing with medium exchange, competing with unit of account, it's more like 10 trillion multiplied by 100 trillion multiplied by 2,000 trillion, and this is where you get <laughs> yeah. stupid numbers. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, um, hat so I can see your boner, mate. Yeah, I mean, he, he I mean, loves numbers. All right now, I'm just thinking is I hope that Peter and I share a soft cell because <laughs> with your boner, <laughs> with the, well, yeah, the, boner. <laughs> like, like, like the coo- one flew over the cuckoo's nest. This is going to be a, like if we if we're wrong, that's where I want to be. That's that's, mm. that's where I want to be. I want to be medicated to my eyeballs <laughs> and have yeah. these conversations. This is it's just logical. It seems. I mean, sadly, it seems sadly I think that is a logical. I think that is a logical progression too. And then, and, and this is, you know, I thank Michael for literally, you know, literally I get to speak to Mike, you know, so often about this stuff. And it, it's, I, I don't get to have these conversations with many people, but the next stage, once you go beyond that, I look at, you know, a key innovation with what's going on that Bitcoin has that no other asset has is you've got a time lock function that you can't undo even if you have a private key. Now, I know there are time locks that allow you to time lock it for, say, 120 years, but then you can withdraw it if you've got the private key. But Michael's got the private key. He's given the private key to the world, and there's no way you can unlock it until that block height number or that year. And all of a sudden, I think that's going to have a profound impact. Already, I can see what it's going to do for for my job and my day-to-day. All of a yeah. sudden, I can plan out literally a, an annuity schedule for someone yes. for the next 50 years and give them 0.1 of a Bitcoin yes. for the next 50 years, and they've got you know five Bitcoin. Um, alternatively, um, I think it's going to have a profound impact, something that you know Preston's talked a lot about in the last 12 months. And again, I've tried to talk to him or reach out to him and say, hey, have you considered how time-locking Bitcoin can solve our biggest financial problem right now, which is duration risk. So if you look at duration risk, duration risk is the biggest risk that we face in finance because it basically encapsulates and it's a a way to measure how much inflation, interest rates and exchange rate risks are going to affect an asset over a period of time. And so can you think about getting a bond issued and then it's backed by a percentage or a, a Bitcoin or two that matures at that date or period in time that the bond matures. So all of a sudden, you're taking Bitcoin off the market, locking it up for the next 20 years or 30 years or two years, however long the bond term is, Mm -hmm. and it's effectively underwritten in some part by this time lock Bitcoin. Yeah. So 21 million becomes, you know, 17 million for lost becomes... God knows what between loss between now and whenever. So and time lock. and then people who burn it and then people who lock it. And I mean, ultimately, I mean, yeah. just are you, the twenty. Who knows where the how low the number gets? Have you done with like done lots of psychedelics and stuff to get to all these kind of big fucking ideas? No, but it's something I'm really interested in. I'm terrified of drugs, but I'm very very um, curious about doing ayahuasca, ibogaine. Um, Maybe some DMT or psilocybin, but I haven't done any of it. Me, me yeah. either. Well, I've had acid. I think I've said before I've had acid when I was eighteen. I shouldn't have, but um, was yeah, it a good I, experience for you? It was a fantastic until I wanted it to end. So, like, right. I didn't realize I was eighteen. I I had it at I think eleven thirty or, or twelve at night. I didn't realize it lasted eight eight to twelve hours, and I had to work the next day. So it was fantastic. <laughs> But then when it, when I went to bed, it was the worst thing in the world. Um, but yeah, I like, I'm I think I'm the same as you. I, I'd love to try, you know, all kinds of different psychedelics just for that kind of mind expansion kind of idea. But but I'm I'm a bit scared as well. Yeah, I think this is where Bitcoin takes you. Right, you end up going down so many rabbit holes with Bitcoin. You end up questioning money. You end up questioning just about everything out there. And then it feels like you almost finish the internet. And yeah. then everything you studied previously or looked at previously, when you look at that again with what you're learning or what learnings you've taken from Bitcoin, it's just a completely different lens. And then I guess the next abstraction or next layer on top of that is probably the mind mind enhancing or mind expanding drugs. So, yeah. Have you had mushrooms, Pat? No, no, I haven't. There's a pot idea. Pod or pod yeah. on mushrooms. Yeah, you and I, just, would, we'll yeah. take them on the pod and just see what happens. Okay. <laughs> I'd love to see that, please. <laughs> Maybe. That, that could be Maybe. weird. I'm scared shitless. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah but yes. But um, I, sorry, you guys finished on that because you please keep going if you want to, but I have it someone else. 
No, 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 move on. That was that. Sorry, I it's, totally took you know, that off. Yours on mushrooms and music. That's basically where you go. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> so no, it's all good. Go. Cool. Um, so I saw a post today, and it was I. I don't even know where it was. Somebody was complaining about um, self checkouts in supermarkets, right? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, yeah. there'll, there'll be a point to this hopefully then. Um, and people work. You know, don't go to the robot. Go. You know, we need to go to a person. But I'm sure those same people are also complaining that they don't have enough time in their life. And all these efficiencies that actually do save you time and money, right? Um, because it's the supermarket is supermarket is cheaper because they're putting in the robots, right? So um what happens therefore if people if if you if you're sitting on an okay chunk of Bitcoin that's just increasing in value all the time, you don't have to do the job that you currently do that you hate. All of these innovations are happening and you you'll you can just allow them to happen mm. because they're making your life better and better and better like and what, in, instead we're all working harder than we've ever right. worked it doesn't yeah yeah there's, there's we shouldn't be this right. is the jeff booth side right yeah, yeah yeah so um but where does that take like where does that take people like where did what i mean yes i'm sure some people will just sit on the sofa get fatter and fatter and then die like yes yeah. that will happen. but also like the people who have a have a absolute, you know, you want to sing, you want to draw, you want to create. You, you look at Brecky doing his um, um, sculpture and stuff. Oh like that. yeah, like that guy's mm -hmm. obviously found something that he loves, and he's like, well, I can kind of do this now. And I'm sure he's working on the side. I'm sure he's not, you know, crazy wealthy guy yet, but hopefully he will be. But that just is a little example of a guy who's found a thing who's like, well, I'm going to do this. What the fuck could we create as a as a as a society as a yeah as a humanity if all of a sudden half of the people have all of their time, time free. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is where I think we we led to the golden age, and you know I think you covered this conversation or or topic with Bronze Foz on that podcast where you talked about what what that looked like because you mentioned his move mm -hmm. from his traditional job to farming, and my my take on this is is that you know typically everyone's been afraid of technological innovation that you know we're going to lose our jobs and what will we do. We're really fundamentally creative creatures that need to have or ex express a creative outlet. And I look at, you know, robots taking out jobs and all these, you know, efficiency gains as, as a beautiful thing because at the end of the day, what we'll be left with is uh, effectively we will all be able to pursue our passions. And at the moment, you know, I don't know what you guys do day to day. You know what I do day to day. I, I have to split my day between, you know, traditional finance and Bitcoin and then, you know, in some weird mashup merge the two. But, you know, a lot of people are working jobs they don't want to be doing and they want to be pursuing things that are, you know, they're passionate about. And Bitcoin, I think, allows that leap for a, a society that enables us to pursue our passion projects and make that our life. And then when you think about what that means from a societal perspective, what happens when everyone's operating on that effectively that self-actualized level when you look at Maslow's needs hierarchy. I'm not sure if you guys are yeah. familiar with that or discuss that, but no, I think board, Bitcoin. Yes. Yeah. So I think if if you look at the Maslow's needs hierarchy, it's basically human needs on a scale. And basically it starts out with, you know, oxygen and water is fundamentally food, what you need with shelter. Yeah. And then it goes up the scale all the way to you know, meaningful, meaningful relationships, love, and then finally self-actualization where you're effectively, you know, doing God's work or whatever you think God's work happens to be. And for Bitcoin, there's a lot of that is literally having these conversations and, you know, talking about Bitcoin and what could be and, you know, helping educate people in this space. And, and I think what happens when you've got 8 billion people self-actualizing, doing everything that they love? I mean, the quality of work, the quality of goods, the quality of service, man, it, it will be, you know, something that we've never experienced. And I'm not concerned about, you know, people losing their jobs. I think Bitcoin solves a whole host of problems. It solves a, a scarcity issue. It solves um, a whole host of things. And one sort of thought that's sort of run through my head with, you know, there's, uh, what is it, four or five layers to that Maslow's needs hierarchy. I think if you put an uncomfortable amount of your wealth into Bitcoin. Basically, each halving is fundamentally a layer in the Maslow's needs hierarchy. So by the time you've been through three or four halvings without selling that initial stack, from a monetary perspective, you'll be self-actualizing. You'll yeah. have more money than God. You'll be able to do whatever you wish. <laughs> That's brilliant. And That's absolutely brilliant. 
Yeah. Um, so you're totally right. I'd never considered. But it's just that. it's 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 just a time time thing though, and this is where you know we've all done the work on Bitcoin, which makes these conversations so much easier and far more palatable. And I don't feel crazy discussing that. But you know when you done that work you're confident that bitcoin's going to continue to work when you're confident it's going to continue to work you're confident that basically it's only a matter of time before everyone else figures this out and then assets pile into it and the thing i'm waiting for is and what i'm trying to help enormously and one of the reasons why we help clients self-custody is we don't want any clients to have bitcoins on exchange because obviously the risk that it's you know not their coins to start with but secondly and probably more selfishly i want to see this price go up i want to see these exchanges have real price discovery when you know there's less than a hundred thousand bitcoins on exchange in five or ten years time and basically governments are going to start buying this thing and it's just going to go limit up they're going to be buying for a million two million ten million they don't care they're printing whatever money they've got mm. costs them nothing to print it and we're going to be sitting on a stack mm. So you mentioned price discovery. Um, yep. When I look at the chart just now, I can't help but thinking that what we're seeing is not natural movement. Explain. What do you, what do you mean? Explain, please. Well, like you'll see a you'll see a period of no, like a like a really narrow band, um, top and bottom for a period of days, weeks, or, you know, nearly even months, and then a stupid rocket or a stupid fall based on nothing at all. Mm. Um, and then another band um, for another period of um, days, weeks, or months. Um, am I seeing things? Or how, do you have an opinion on that? No, I think it's a, it's a very heavily manipulated market. I think um, CBOE, CME, um, you know, Chicago Board of Options Exchange and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange operate the biggest, you know, futures options markets in the world. And they do Bitcoin. Predominantly, a lot of that is cash settled, not Bitcoin settled. So that has the ability to really um, fundamentally undermine price discovery and really manipulate the price because you've got options basically either pushing prices down or pushing prices up. And that's why, you know, we probably saw in the last week or so that real pop and it just sort of happened. And what you saw is um, you had people who had a lot of puts on thinking the price was going to go lower. Um, and what that means is basically someone thinks that, you know, they buy a put at say 16, call it 17,000 US dollars. And, you know, they expect the price to go down to 10 or five or whatever they're expecting. So, they basically have an obligation to pay back that 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 Bitcoin. And so what happens is the trade, if it were to go down with that put, they'd make a fortune. But when it goes against them, all of a sudden they realise they're out of the money. And then what they actually have to do is buy the physical Bitcoin to make good on that promise with, with the contract to the put. So you've got a double whammy. It hasn't gone the way you wanted. And then you basically got to buy that asset at a higher price, which then forces the price up. And basically it's a cascading of liquidations. And one of my favorite Twitter follows on um, Twitter is, you know, basically, you know, rec.com or whatever it is, where it basically gives you how much was lost on, on the, on the day for, for the puts or the options or whatever <laughs> the, the trade was. And it, it's just, if you, if you truly understood Bitcoin, there's no way on earth you would put, like buy an option put on Bitcoin because, uh, I mean, I go to bed night, you know, some nights thinking, is this the night that we have a 10x up in price when a government, uh, you know, a big petro company, a big bond bond manager basically says, shit, I'm way short on this. I need to go and basically get set on this. I'm prepared to do whatever I've got to. I'll pay whatever I've got to to get set and I'll set a new floor in the price. And at some point in time, that's going to happen. Um, I just don't know when it is. And if you've got that sort of unlimited upside to an asset, <clears throat> when you put a hard stop on it with absolute scarcity, having a put on it where you're betting on this thing going down, bearing in mind it's the best returning asset ever in history, like it, it's a certain level of madness or hubris, um, chutzpah, that 
I, I just can't fathom. It's like, just like playing with fire. It's like, mate, you're going to blow yourself up. And I, I quietly, I, I don't like to see or, in you know, get enjoyment from watching, you know, misery like that. But I can't help but chuckle inside to think you guys have done no work on this. If you if you had done even a, a modicum of work on this, there's no way you'd risk that type of loss. So, yeah. Do they have, uh, like, do they have an algorithm work in the background that um, could get themselves out of a horrible position real fast, um, where, whereas we couldn't do that? Is that possible? Or do you think it's just, as you say, hubris, and they're, they're just going to get crushed one day? At some point in time, they do get crushed. But in the short term, you know, everything works until it doesn't, like Plan B's model. You know, I'm <clears throat> a huge... Well, not a. I'm a. I'm a big fan of Plan B and the work he did, and a lot of people don't like him because you know he made price predictions. But one one thing I've, I I'm hugely grateful to Plan B for is that he bought more eyeballs to Bitcoin than anyone else, and I think he bought more eyeballs to Bitcoin than even Sailor did. And if we look back in the last, you know, the last epoch of Bitcoin, there have been two major influences in the last four years. One of them's Michael Saylor, who is an outstanding advocate, and I think our our leading voice in Bitcoin. He's our leading thought leader. He's fundamentally a, our best advocate. And then you look at Plan B. He probably bought in 50 million eyeballs or 100 million eyeballs to Bitcoin and on this price model discovery that he created. And um, I, I look at that and I think, you know, I, I watch Corey and a number of other Bitcoin maxis get upset with Plan B for, you know, putting false hope in the market. And it's like, guys, that's not his job, you know, to to give false hope. His job is to deliver a model that he thinks works. He said consistently that, hey, this this is a model that's going to break at some point, you know, but I think it's useful for making decisions. It's how you interpret what he says where people go or get into trouble. And what I think we as a Bitcoin community didn't do a great job of is that when 100 million people came to Bitcoin or 50 million people came to Bitcoin on the back of that that work, we didn't have the education, the support, reach out to the people who are coming here just for the price to help these people learn about Bitcoin and actually make them a lot stickier. So sadly, what happened is they came to Bitcoin to get rich. And when the model went the other way and it didn't pan out exactly as he you know, had spoken about, 49 or 48 or 45 million people just got shot off out of that gravity, gravity well from Bitcoin, probably to return in 10 years time when it's a million or 10 million bucks a coin. So, you know, I take, you know, responsibility as a community that we we could have done a better job educating those who were coming to it at the time. So, yeah. Uh, yeah well said. I completely agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was a model, and I think he always was very clear that it was a model. It was a model that works until it doesn't work. It's just, you know, use yeah. it as one of your tools and, and your arsenal arsenal of tools. I totally agree. He did then get involved in a little bit of... Um, shit coiny. Yeah. How about shit coiny or, like, promotion of things that i don't really i didn't pay i didn't pay too there much was some subscriber to thing yeah so the, i think it was used by referral link for shitcoin casino is that what it yes. was was yeah. what most people objected to <clears throat> and look i get it but hey you know here's a guy who's gone from total obscurity to two million followers on bitcoin <laughs> as yeah. an introvert i could i can only imagine i'm very sympathetic to um yeah i would know i would not know how to deal with that type of of mental mm -hmm. pressure but um a funny side note, we we had him come and talk to our clients um, in November last year and um, had a great conversation with him for about an hour before, um, about two weeks before he came up and gave us a presentation. And he was talking to me about um, how he's got a new model that he's working on. And we discussed that it was obviously very tough for him to go from, you know, zero followers to two million followers, be literally known world over. And um, it, I think, you know, obviously had a profound effect on his mental health having yeah. to deal with that. And so um, we were talking about this new model and um, I said, oh, you need a NIM account for your NIM account. And he <laughs> goes, what do you mean? I said, so <laughs> so you avoid all these haters who hate you. <laughs> set, up, set up a NIM account for your NIM account. Release this thing to the wild if it's better than the last one. Everyone is going to froth over this, even the Bitcoin Maxis who have given you shit in the past. Yeah. 
and then don't go on a podcast for six months so we can all get jizzed up about it and then finally go on a podcast and the second he opens his mouth, yeah. the entire Bitcoin community will go, surprise, this bloke again. <laughs> Did he yeah. do it? Is I it, don't know. I don't know. He's, he's the best part, right? I don't know. Yeah, I, I hope he does because I, I I think he's a... I think he is a good faith actor. I think he's been very good for Bitcoin because I think more eyeballs and attention to Bitcoin is is a positive for Bitcoin. And then it's our job to educate people and, you know, go deeper with them than just the price. Yeah. Um. So where are we now? What would have happened if that had happened today? Like, how do you think the quality of the content is now? I think it works on a deeper level. You know, when when it's when price is going up, and you probably, you know, find this because, you know, you guys have been doing this for a while. It's very difficult to get in touch with, you know, the thought leaders in the space, like guys like Knut or, say, Gigi or, you know, whoever your favourites are that you want to talk to when the price is going up and everyone's frothing on Bitcoin. These guys are really hard to get a hold of. However, you know, in bear markets, all of a sudden, the phones stop ringing, people have time, you can have a deep, meaningful conversation with someone and you know you can broaden your network um dramatically in a bear market so i i think there's there's pros and cons you know obviously we just want say in my line of work i just want the number to go up just every day i want it to go up 10 percent and never stop going up but um it'd make my job a whole lot easier um because sadly all all my clients care about and me to a very base level is you know number go up but there's something far more profound happening um, than than just the number going up. Have you ever lost clients over this? Or not as yet. Touch wood. <laughs> Sorry, I went quiet from a minute. No. Oh shit! What was that? No, you haven't. No, so no, no. But you've t- you're talking sort of sixteen, and so they've ridden up up and down with you multiple times now. Yeah, <laughs> Is that a few have. Yeah, my best term term of work, term of written up and that. No, yeah. Really, Peter. <laughs> but they have. Yeah, they've gone. The, 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 <laughs> they've gone on the journey, so they're going to be pretty good, pretty decent level of conviction now. Some of the guys that got in early. Yeah, yeah, and 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 this is where I, I guess you know bear markets really teach you lessons that um, you you kind of have to cut your teeth on and. You know, because my clients are a lot older, some clients want to sell Bitcoin and I I try my best to talk them out of it because I think, hey, we just need four more years and, you know, you'll get a 10x in four years. Um, mm-hmm. But um, th- that's probably been, this bear market has probably been one thing that's changed me and having a much deeper understanding of what my clients' needs are that, you know, this isn't a, you know, exit strategy isn't death for them. It's, mm-hmm. hey, this is a great way to build our wealth enjoy the ride, take some off the table and provide for our kids, our grandchildren, you know, education expenses, whatever it might be. And and this is where, from a personal note, I I would like to think the exit strategy is death. But, you know, clients don't feel like that or have that conviction. So it's it's really important for me, and this is one thing I've learned, it's bear markets are really brutal, particularly, you know, no one, no one looks at, you know, what price they entered Bitcoin. They always look at the high watermark and then realize, hang on a sec, I'm down 70% from high watermark, not hang on, I'm up 10 or 20x from where I got in. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, what are, okay. So, what are the, what's, let's go negative, right? So, what, what are your concerns? Like, what would, what do you, what, not keeps you awake at night, but like, what, what, what concerns you about Bitcoin? Um, it's all relative. So, if you understood the risks in every other asset, <laughs> Bitcoin's the least of your worries, literally. Yeah. Um, and and this is kind of what I talk to clients about is that, you know, I I think there's very little risk with Bitcoin. There's huge volatility, but there's very little risk. So, you know, we go through and spend a lot of time talking about network metrics and, you know, the, the network metrics right now are fundamentally better than they've ever been. You know, we look up Clark Moody dashboard, we look at the hash rate, we look at the number of nodes, we look at when the last block was basically mined. And as long as that network value proposition is in that it's just working, that's literally all Bitcoin has to do. It just has to keep working. The price and the abs where, where we get into trouble is the abstraction layer that we put above the actual network, which is the dollar value that we want to ascribe to it. 
because it doesn't represent the fundamental performance of the network. And so that's where there's the mismatch. And when clients understand that the network's working perfectly, they have much greater conviction to just hold that and know that the, the price will come back because it, it's such a unique thing. And um, I think Jason Lowry does a good job of trying to expand on, you know, what the potentiality for Bitcoin is. I tend to agree with him that there's a potential to build a whole another network or another, you know, internet on that's that's basically decentralized and censorship resistant on Bitcoin. Um, once you realize that it's so much more than just money, it's it, it becomes a no-brainer. So what keeps me up at night is really the other side of the assets that we're invested in. You know, we look at property, you know, interest rates are going through the roof, property prices need to come off dramatically. You know, that keeps me up at night. It's not the Bitcoin that keeps me up at night. And to be fair, when, when we get clients to invest in Bitcoin, I do a very good job. We've got disclaimers. We've got, you know, a whole host of documents or documentation that we ask clients to sign before we get any investment from them. And and fundamentally, we lay out that there is a, a real possibility that whatever money they put into this, they could lose. So as long as you have that, you know, downside risk with Bitcoin is that it goes to zero. Um, expectations from, from a client level are, I guess, met anything better you know above that and we've exceeded expectations mm. um with a business like yours um would you be expected so let's say property was to do a you know 40 percent um drop right would would yep. you then be expected to rebalance and sell down a bitcoin position at that point and then to to go back to your whatever your numbers are for each client or how does how's that process thought about it depends it depends and it's a case-by-case -case basis and I'll, I'll share a story with you that um you know, we 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 had a client who, um, you know, was was a gorgeous family we looked after, and um, sadly, the mother passed away um, in their seventies, late seventies, and and we spoke to to the three children and said, you know, looking at this portfolio is massively overweight Bitcoin. Sixty percent of their investable assets were in Bitcoin. Wow. Um, not bad going for nearly an eighty year old and. Um, we said to the kids, hey, you know, this is grossly overweight. We should really adjust the portfolio, um, sell some and put it into other stuff. Or you can just leave it. You just let us know what you want to do. And the the, the children were fabulous. They just said, no, we're happy. We're, we can leave that. We're good. We've done yeah. the work on that. We're good. So, you know, that's a, that's a very satisfying feeling when, you know, you've been able to take a, a family on a journey with that and, and they're so well versed in it. They're so far down the rabbit hole that, they don't want to change the investment allocation despite being 60% of investable assets. So, yeah. Wow. So what late seventies and she had that much allocation. That's huge. Yeah. Well, like it's, that's way out on the bell curve as far as. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's great though. Like I had a thought, I had a thought today, like people are saying you like the boomers, you can't expect the boomer to remember 12 words. Well, you're talking to the same boomer who can still remember their friend's house number because they used to call it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. There's eight digits, so they can remember eight. Four more is not going to be a big thing, right? Yeah, I mean, it is, it's, yeah, but it, it is, yeah, understanding that it's it can be that simple, and if you just want to buy, hold, store, and be safe, it can be really yeah. quite simple. You don't have to spend all day every day learning like every like most people don't know how the radio works; they just use it or the telly or the whatever the car yeah. doesn't matter it just works yeah and that's what bitcoin is going to be it just works yeah. that, that's that's one thing i think people get caught up just trying to you know understand everything about it. it's like well you're not a computer scientist like you're not a computer engineer you're not a dev like just let it go you're not going to understand it fully you just need to have a little bit of exposure um i'll tell you a funny story i had with um my one of my great mates from school called me up uh, maybe 2017 and said, oh, I heard you know about Bitcoin. Talk to me about Bitcoin. I said, oh, um, and bearing in mind, this is a guy who earns a small fortune um, working in the financial markets and is one of the most charming, charismatic men I've ever met. He um, called me up, talked to me about Bitcoin. Talk to me about Bitcoin, Pete. What do I know? I'm like, you just need to get something. He goes, oh, yeah, look, oh, I don't know about this. And I'm like, look, 
you really need to get some. He goes, all, all, all the IT guys here are buying it, and they're, all they do is talk about it. I was like, yeah, <laughs> the, the IT guys get it faster than the finance guys get it, so maybe you should buy some too because, you know, the finance guys are thick as pig shit yeah. relative to the IT guys, right? And he's like, oh, you know what? I earn X and X and X. You know, I'm really smart, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, bullshit. I was at school with you. I know what maths you did. You could yeah. barely add two and two. Like, just so happens he's the greatest salesman on earth. So he doesn't have <laughs> numbers. And he's like, all right, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm like, are they smarter than you? He's like, yeah, they're a lot smarter. It's like, and why are they buying it? So, you know, it's, uh, you know, there are so many articles now where, we just didn't have access to this five or six years ago. Like one article that sort of I think has a huge, huge value in our community is is Creases. You know why the yuppie elite don't get Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. You know I love his work. I think he's you know a fabulous advocate for Bitcoin, and that that stuff really hits home. That you know you sort of everyone has an you know an internal bias to to what they want to happen and. The funny thing is Bitcoin's going to happen regardless of what your internal biases is and yeah. it's just going to run over any sort of, you know, I guess direction that you would hope for it to go. It's it's just a law unto its own and whether you're involved in it or whether you're not, it's not going to matter, I believe, in the future. Uh, so did you make buy Bitcoin or not? No. Oh, <laughs> Very still? sad about that. Still? Still not. Still not. I'm like... <laughs> So well, he's, he's dumb as pig shit. <laughs> he, he really is, and I'm a bit harsh on that, but I, I really wish he would. And, you know, here's the ironic thing, working in finance, the ultimate hedge he can have working in finance, even me working in finance, you know, Bitcoin's going to fundamentally disrupt financial advice, it'll disrupt financial markets, it'll disrupt bond markets. You know, the ultimate thing he could have as a hedge against, you know, his own, you know, income, his own future mm-hmm. Is having yeah. some exposure to that because it gives him an out if if it does come along and effectively disrupt his his living. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, everybody, everybody needs a hedge. You um, do, and and there aren't many hedges left in this world. No, mate. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, I think I'd also like to maybe come back another time and do a bit of a. And like a more more of a sort of an inheritance planning talk, if that's okay. I think that's sort of important sure. to too, and we probably didn't quite get deeply in enough in, 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 deeply into that enough. Um, well, we, it depends. It depends. Okay it depends on what uh, what did you did Jake talk to you about? Oh yeah, true. Yes. <laughs> um, Jake was just the personal story, and I, I think you know there are a couple of personal anecdotes talked about, and um, I um. Didn't didn't go into a lot of the stuff that we talked about. I don't think there'll be much crossover. Yeah, cool. So, so think, we're, we're better we're, though, yeah? We're better? The best. <laughs> the very best. <laughs> yeah, well, put that, put that this is the thing I love about this. I love about this space. Like, you know, we we are all serving a higher purpose fundamentally. Yeah, and yeah, this yeah. is where, you know, for the first time in human history, I believe, we have a tool that can basically align all of our incentives. Yeah. Regardless of class or creed, you know, we can all get behind it. So it's quite a, you know, from a human psyche perspective, it's a fascinating study. Big yeah. time. It's great that something you do can benefit me and something I do can benefit you and something Brendel does can, you know, pour us a drink of wine. Yeah. That's about it. Hey, do you want to hear, do you want to hear before we go, do you want to hear some crazy stat? Yeah. Uh, yes. Oh, you've blown me, blown me already. I was going to say. By my mind already. <laughs> so, so that you know how they talked about that five billion dollars um, was purchased, and that was the pump that created the twenty five percent bump in price. Nope, I don't know what or there is. was. So, so there was some conjecture that there was you know five billion dollars of Bitcoin purchased and put into a single wallet, and that was basically what led to this twenty five percent pump in price. I didn't see that either. No, oh. but go on. So, so just looking at the numbers, and this is where, you know, as we continue to talk over the next, you know, five, 10, 15 years, this is going to get really crazy. But the numbers we look at at the moment, if if that five billion dollar purchase was true, that led to the market cap of Bitcoin moving from three hundred and thirty million to four hundred and ten million. Oh, sorry, billion. So a five billion dollar purchase. Has increased the market cap by eighty billion dollars. 
yeah. or roughly 14 times. Wow. Yeah. Now, if you look at the supply side of things, you know, where there's going to be demand coming in, obviously you're going to have, you know, companies buy it like Michael Saylor. There'll be, he, he won't be the last company to buy it. Then you're going to have countries basically investing their bonds, bond money that should have gone to bonds into Bitcoin. And the big one that I look at that I think, you know, is on the cards probably sooner than we think is, you know, you're effectively your oil and gas countries that are producing oil and gas like Saudi Arabia and mm. Russia. You know, there, there's 100 million barrels of oil a day produced, which at $70 a barrel conservatively is $7 billion worth of demand daily. And when those countries figure out that they can just buy Bitcoin rather than get paid in US dollars and they can't have it seized, they can't have it censored, and there's absolute scarcity, you know, what happens when $7 billion a day goes into this market, which will happen at some point in time, all of a sudden, you know, that $80 billion market bump in a day, you know, that that's 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 a decaying schedule too. So it was a 14x return on that $5 billion, you know, and as more and more coins come off the exchange, rather than a $5 billion bump being 14 x it might be a 20x the next time as more and more coins come off exchange. So this is the asymmetric upside I'm here for that I love thinking about. And um, it's going to be fun to watch over the next few years to see what happens there. Now I've got a boner. <laughs> but, nobody, but nobody can see it. So... <laughs> Man, Great to I check, guys. I'd, I'd love to come back and talk about that estate planning because I think it's it's something that um, I don't think gets enough attention. You know, we all have our security setups and I'm happy to talk about, you know, how we think about estate planning from a client perspective, how to get those Bitcoins to beneficiaries and, you know, happy to share whatever we do here and what you need to be thinking about. So if that can help people have confidence taking Bitcoins off exchange, that's, you know, a, a huge motivator for me. So awesome. Love to see it. Awesome. Do, do you want to do, do you want to do a quick shout out for your handle or, you know, the business or what, whatever yeah, yeah. you want, whatever you want. Uh, don't worry about the business. Um, but the handle on Twitter is Dunworth underscore Peter. And um, I'm pretty useless on Twitter. I just lurk there and like a few things, but um, very rarely post things. And um, if anyone's got any questions, just yeah, DM me. That'd be great. You're going to be kicking around a Bitcoin alive? Definitely. Yeah, I'll be there. I'm, right. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And yeah. I think there's a couple of speakers who I know who are going to be there. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing their their sessions. And I said um, to one of the guys there, you know, I'm happy to help in any way if there's any help needed. And um, hopefully some of the clients come along too. I think they'll really enjoy it and it'd be nice to see an Australian event put on. So yeah. any support or help we can give, we'd, we'd love to help. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Peter. Loved it. Loved it, mate. I'm going to have to go Thanks, away guys. for a while. This might be our longest pod, by the way. But it could be. Yeah, it could yeah, be. Yeah. Oh, shit. All right. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> no, all good. Thanks, mate. Thanks, fellas. Yeah. Awesome catch up. Cheers.